make a Stripe deck do a file? Because this is like, there's going to be a bunch of steps here, and maybe it just is all one thing. So, Stripe Go, package, uh, I think I call this Stripe example. The double E's there kind of throw me off. Um, so we'll have const uh, Stripe API key equal the thing I got from the docs. Uh, so these, these need to be your, this needs to be your Stripe API key. And I showed you where to get it, but it's in the docs too. So in, in this stripe.com slash docs slash tutorials slash charges, this is it. That's the API key. Um, okay, so that'll be our, our first step is to get that Stripe API key. Uh, and then if we look at their example, they get the token. We got that. We have that from the what we just did. And then they make this charge. Okay. So how do we do that in Go? Uh, well, let's make a function called charge account. G not charge account. I did that last time. Charge account. Um, what, what is this guy going to take? It will take the token. It will take the token. So stripe token stripping. I think it needs to take other things. I think it also needs to take a context. Will it need Oops. the uh, straight API key? No, we got that right there, saved above. Uh, it's going to take something else, but for now, let's just do this. Um, straight token, and then an error maybe. So charge account takes a context. That's how we'll make our HTTP calls. And then it's a Stripe token, and then yeah. So Stripe's API is, a, is an HTTP API. So to make the charge on Stripe, we have to make an HTTP request to their API. Now they have a library which does those requests for us, uh, but that is what it's doing underneath. And so because of that, because it's an HTTP API, we have to use URL fetch, okay? Because remember, on App Engine, I can't make an HTTP request. I have to make it through the service, the URL fetch service. Okay. Uh, but remember also that in Go, that returns an HTTP client that's the same as the other HTTP client. So it, it can be very easily integrated uh, because the, the library hides that. It's abstracting that away. Um, so we see here they have this Stripe charge. They have something very similar in Go. A charge. To charge a credit card, create a charge object. If your API key is in test mode, the supply payment source won't actually be charged, though everything else will occur as in live mode. Um, so we say charge.new, and here's the example we have. Um, so you, you give it charge parameters. This will tell you the amount, the currency, description. Here's our key. And you'll set the source, and this is the token. And then you'll say charge that you give the parameters, and it will make the charge. I think we have to do something additional here, but um, let me see if I can find that. Well, let's just do this for now, and then we'll swap it out. Okay. So does this make sense? The basic steps here. We have our key. Tell, tell me about the hands. Stripe charge param. So that kind of looks, I mean, that looks like a struct to me, right? It is, it is a struct. Okay. This is creating the, the things that you'll pass to you. And, and uh, Stripe is the package. And so in the package Stripe, there's a struct called charge param yep. that's already been created. So we're saying create an instance of charge param? That's right. Okay. And it's a pointer. Yeah. To the ABC. But that's because that's what we do. So it's like creating charge, here are all the settings, all the options. And in description there, could we, if we wanted to, like, elaborate just for documentation or whatever, because I imagine this would all be stored on their servers if we're sending it to them. Can we put in the, oh, sorry, go back up. No, no, but here's the description. Oh, can we put in another, okay, what is it? You can attach the charge object. It is displayed in the web interface, okay? So that's okay, what it okay, so it's shows up in that dashboard. Alongside the charge. Yeah. And so that's just for our own reference. Maybe you put a reference number, maybe you put the account ID, okay. something like that. Re 
reference number would be good, probably not. Um, and we'll see maybe in a second, well, in a bit, how to make this more full fledged. Um, but let's just, uh, we'll just do the charge for now. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of funny. Minimum amount is 50 cents. <laughs> they have to make some money. They charge you 30 cents every transaction, lit flat mm -hmm. yeah. straight out, and then 2.9% on top of that, and then 2% foreign. Yeah, it gets pretty So basically, that's the minimum for you at least being the money. It's very good. It says that I do not need yeah. money on transaction. Yeah. That's about 50 cents. Okay. So, positive integer in the smallest currency unit. So in US dollars, it's cents. And in yen, it's yen. That's interesting. Yeah, so. Holy cow, they support a lot of currencies. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. That's kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> they support Bitcoin, even, too. Yeah. <laughs> Bitcoin. Uh, OK, so Bitcoin is special. Because um, Bitcoin has no fees. So, okay, so we can create this. So we need to create the charge parameters. Uh, well, actually, we have the stripe.key equal. So, in, so what we want to do here is in an init, we'll say stripe.key equals this guy. So instead of the constant, we'll just set it this way. Okay. So uh, basically, we're storing the key in the stripe package. Because it uses it. Is that key or is it a key? This is key. I mean, it resolved, so I'm assuming that's correct. Um, so I set the key to this thing I got from the docs. So that's the first step here. Okay. The next step is to create this, so let's copy that. Um, let me see. Okay, the amount, remember, is cents, so let's say 100 times, and then we said 200,000, right? So that's the amount um, that we want to charge. Two hundred, yeah, two hundred thousand dollars. And then there's the currency, and then the description charge for testing. Okay. And then we pass that to. Oh, we got a set source. So here we go. Set source. What's this going to be? It's the token that was returned from the JavaScript. Yeah, so stripe token. And then we can do new. So you say charge.new, give it these parameters, and it will create the charge on stripe servers and possibly return an error. So we're just going to, uh, you know, if error not equal nil, return the error. Uh, otherwise, we're going to log info at. charge just to see what we got back and return the bill. Okay. Um, pretty straightforward to understand what we're doing. Uh, so, you know, we might add to this function the amount as an option to pass in. Uh, maybe the user is email or that kind of stuff. But for now, it's all. Uh, we'll see what this does. Okay, so over here, when we handle payment, instead of printing out the Stripe token, what we want to do is make the charge. So, here, for an equal uh, charge count. Uh, this is get the context, so that'll be bad. And the stripe token is the stripe token. And then fair and equal nil. Um, and you should do it else on that if it says something like Okay. Uh, there you go. <laughs> um, so if everything is great, you might go crank, but if it fails, then it is. Now it can fail for legitimate reasons. You know, uh, your credit card's been denied, that kind of stuff. Um, so actually, you should probably handle either. Um, 
No, I mean, this isn't bad. It'll show them the error. Maybe you'll be showing them too much information if you do that. Um, let's see if we can get this to work. Oh, awesome. Okay. Client transport of type init failing transport doesn't support cancel request timeout. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. I think what's happening here is we're, we're using the built in HTTP client from Go. We can't use that. We have to use URL fetch. Okay. So we need to tell it to do that. And there is a way to do that if I can find it in here. Not impossible to get the pull. Um, yeah, I guess a lot of people are doing the uh, using App Engine for this. Um, let me try Go Doc. Set. HTTP client. There we go. <laughs> this is useful if you're running in a Google App Engine environment where the HTTP call client is not available. Okay? So we just have to call set HTTP client and give it the HTTP client. Okay? Does that make sense? No? is that um, I think it should be an init, but we can't really do that because we don't have the context yet. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, that would be a problem. I mean, that's in stripe.go, it's the only time you call, call the stripe API, so it's the only time you need. Uh, we'll just do it this way for now and come back to it. But, uh, okay, so remember that. So that's what we said here. So because we're on App Engine. custom HTTP client. Normally it uses the default. So this way we're using the custom one. Okay. But now it'll make all requests over App Engine's URL fetch library. I think. There we go. You go. Thank you for the money, Saka. Uh, what do we get now? There we go. That's what we like to see. That's my kind of chart. <laughs> We're going straight up. Okay. Uh, we didn't create a customer. So the idea here is that we created a charge and we got the money. Okay? So we got the money. Well, we kind of got the money. Remember, they could always charge back. That's all we care about. I don't know. We didn't send them anything. We did the important part. Um, so in this case, it doesn't have a shopping cart. You have to build or use some kind of shopping cart here? Yeah, if you were selling multiple things, you'd have to make your own. And uh, so that was using the embedded form. Uh, you can also use a custom form, and it describes how to do that in more detail. Mm -hmm. And this is more typical what you see. And maybe at this point, uh, you, you would have to do the work to add up the sum total of how much you're selling and do all that. And the shopping cart, how would we implement a shopping cart? Mm -hmm. well, I Exactly. We'd have a session ID, we'd maybe have a data store for their cart, uh, we'd drop product IDs into it, and we'd store that as a list of product IDs. And then you add the price and product ID. Yeah. We would add them all up together and say, here's the total. So you, you can see how we could build a shopping cart using it. You also have to add in things. Yeah. <laughs> Multiply everything times 100. Um, and, and then, so, yeah, we could have a custom form, make a list, you know, you have this item, this item, this item, this item. And at the end, we would have the Total thing, but all this would be hooked up using the custom form instead of the. Uh, actually, we could still use this, the one they did. We could have a bottom pay now, click it, and it 
shows the other form. Uh, but you can use this form instead if you want it to look cleaner. This, this also makes it so you can hide the fact you're using Stripe. So it's not super obvious that's what you're using if you're paying attention. Nobody actually cares, but if you didn't want to reveal that, you don't have to. How do you hide it? Uh, well, you just don't put any Stripe things in here, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, but on the payment things, it's powered by Stripe. I think with the custom form, you can get rid of all that. Uh, but like I said, I mean, who cares? Uh, your customers do. They've got a really good form. And, and in yeah, fact, yeah. it might make them feel a little better. Like, oh, right. this is a real payment form. You know? yeah. yeah, it's uh, another, another level of security when you abstract away the larger company. Oh. Though if I went to Amazon or Google and they had a Stripe payment form, I would start to wonder what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't Amazon have their own payment form? <laughs> they're bigger than Walmart. I mean, they're going to destroy you. <laughs> yeah, they're big. Okay. They should have their own merchant bankers. They they have their own payment service. What's it called? Uh, it's they, pretty terrible, though. I, wouldn't I think they pulled that down. Oh, they gave up on and it. And Kickstarter used to use them. The Kickstarter money is a strike. Mm. Oh, there you go. Yeah, Amazon kind of gave up on that because it wasn't very good. Um, so, anyway. Okay, so now we can make payments, we can make charges. I mean, uh, I think this is wrong. We need to fix this. I'm not sure how we can fix that. Uh, so I'm just Googling this, and maybe one of these guys will tell you. Um, I'd have to look it up some more, but there's there's a way to do it. Uh, the, the issue, so the issue here is uh, that it's we're setting it like globally, and that's no good. Um, so if we wanted to do it this way, we'd have to use a lock, probably, which maybe is not that big of a deal. But um, in other words, I could have two people making charge at the same time. They would both set HTTP client, and so one would give the wrong HTTP client, and that's not cool um, because this HTTP client client. Is it knows the request that created it. So, uh, so there may be another way to set this somewhere in here. The other option, like I said, is a lock. So we only do one charge at a time, which like I said, may not be that big of a deal. Because if you're taking in thousands of charges per second, I mean, that would be a cool problem to have, right? Uh, that's unlikely to happen. Um, and the, sort of the uh, third option would be to We might be able to use context.background. Uh, so the idea of context background is like a context that represents your application running, not a user. And perhaps you could use that instead of this context. You could say context.background. And we could try it, see what happens. Um, I suspect it won't work. So if you ever need a context, you can do it like this. Yeah, you're not allowed to do that. It has to be an so, anyway. I don't. I don't understand what this problem is. The context you need to the call to that that the charge account, so it's going to be different from another. Yeah, so you can have two charges coming at the same time, and we're like overriding the original HTTP client because it gets used right here. This is like global. That's the problem. HTTP client. Yeah, we need it like per charge. But I'm, there's, like I said, there's probably a work there. I have to look it up. But this does work, right? We did get the charge. We should saw it in the dashboard. Okay, so that's how we make payments. Any questions about that? Um, so there's a lot of options for payments. Uh, like I said, there's this thing. You can add this item potency key uh, right here as part of the parameters to the, to the charge. And this would make it not get repeated. Every transaction yeah. has a unique one. And yeah. so it just says, hey, is this unique one gone through? It's gone yeah, because I might, in this code, uh, this error, and look at the error and see if it was like a network timeout or something. I'd retry. Mm -hmm. And if I do that, if I want to retry, then I should use that item. That seems like a good thing to include no matter what. Are you setting your own key? Or is it going yeah, yeah. And they, they say you can do, how do we generate a key? There you 
go. They're remarkably useful things. Uh, and so, you think if everybody used them for everything, you run out of them. There's just too many. <laughs> uh, dot uh, item potency key equal item dot string. And so now if we did that, we could perhaps in a loop do this guy, okay? And then say if there was no error, you know, break or whatever. You follow me, Andy? Maybe I'll just do it. Why don't you run it multiple times and see what the, uh, uh, what changes to? Um, so let's look up the errors on what it can return because I don't I don't know all the possible errors and maybe there's a nice clean one that we can use uh, to make this easier. It doesn't say it here. It'll say it here. So there's stripe dash go slash charge, and that has this charging. So when we say new, new charge parameters, uh, you know, I don't know the error they can return, but maybe there's a fraud report. <laughs> it is. Um, yeah, I have to look at it more. Sometimes they document that kind of stuff, but they don't seem to. Have Surprising. Fail code in there. Huh? There is a fail code in that list. Uh, you know what we can do? Air dot. So in the net package, there's a net error interface, this error interface, and it has within it a temporary, temporary function. So here's, here's what we're doing, we're saying, if there's an error, and if that error was a net error, a network error, and it's a temporary network error, then continue. But let's put a little bit of sleep in there. Try. So, is it not net error? I thought it was. It is. Go back. You're using net error. Temporary. Oh, thank you. So, let me repeat that again. If there's an error, and if that error is a net error, this is an assertion, like passing assertion. We're saying this error is a net error. We're asserting that it's that. That's when you put parentheses. Where does the error come from? And that's what we're creating, right? So we're saying when we do the assertion, the okay here is whether the assertion succeeded or not. And if it succeeded, then this will be set to a net error. That would be the type of thing, okay? Um, and so this is how you can take an interface and turn it into a particular type. So if I have an interface, progress, progress, I can turn it into, say, an int by saying, um, so if I have, Bar x interface progress, progress equals net. What is x's type? I have flow 64 in the property. Um, so x's type is interface. That's the type of x. Okay. And so I cannot do, uh, you know, I can't say. So that I can do this. That's, that's the question. You have to set x. Um, we use an, a 
assertion. So we'll still have this down here. two ways. You can do it this way, or you can say comma, okay. And then okay will be true or false. So in this case, y will be, so, so this code we have rx interface equal, and then it quotes 10, and then we say y comma okay, colon equal x dot, and then parentheses in. What is this going to be? It's going to make y is false, and so is it going to throw an error when you try to add 100 to it? No. Uh, okay. No. So in this case, y is equal to zero. It's an int. You know, its type is int. So I returned whether it's okay. How, how do I know it's int? It makes a return and say, is it an int because you tried to cast an x into it? That's exactly right. So this type becomes this. Okay. Um, so that's so how I know it's an example, an error will become a net dot error. That's correct. Whether error is true or false. Yes. Uh, so why is y zero? Because it has a default value of net. That's right, that's the default value. So what's the value of okay? False. False. So when so in the two or the return type form, if okay is false, then whatever was on the other side becomes a zero value for what this type is. So y here is an int. Okay, fail, because it's not a string, so it gets just to its default value, its zero value, which is zero, okay? So this prints 100. Now if I change this to a 10, now what does it do? Okay is true, and it prints 110. Yeah, exactly, right? Because now y will be this value, okay? So we're like taking the interface and getting to its underlying type, the real thing concrete type, okay? Um, because an interface can be any type, and it can store anything inside of it, okay? Uh, actually, it's whatever the method set is of the interface. So in order for, this is the empty interface, so it can be any, because everything has no methods of this. Uh, but if it had one method in it, then anything on this side would have to have that method available. And so in the case of error, error uh, is, Anybody remember what's inside the interface? So we're creating a type of the string. Exactly. It's okay. E R R O R string. So if I use error instead of interface here, this would be about why is it number? Because 10 doesn't have the error in Exactly. Because integers don't have an error method. Okay? But if they did, then I could assign it. So when I have an empty interface, it's like, I'm allowed to assign anything to this. When I have an interface with some methods, it's like, I'm only allowed to assign things that have those methods to this. Okay? But either way, interfaces are never a thing in and of themselves. They always store something else, right? Uh, they're like pointers that way. Okay? So x here is an interface that points to another value, 10. So if you imagine, here's a box, x, and 
and it's just pointing to this thing. Okay? And this guy is like pulling that thing out of the box. But it does so using a cat, so you're saying, uh, get the underlying thing as an int. And then we have the two forms to say, did that work or not, right? Because if it didn't work, I want to know that. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm saying, error is type error. I know that. But I don't know necessarily what kind of error it is. And so I'm saying, is it a net error? And the reason I want a net error is it has this nice method. Okay? And so I say, is it a net error? If it is, that's the okay. Then I know, what if, what if okay is false? What is the value of the error? Right. What's the default value for uh, an interface? No. No. Okay. It's like a point of that. It's no. So this would be nil if OK was false. If OK is true, then it's not nil. Okay. And that's why I have to check here. Because I, if I called any error that temporary and it was nil, I would get it. But by checking OK and an error, I'm saying, if it is OK, then I know I can call this method. And I'm using this method to tell me whether or not it was a temporary network error. Because a temporary network error would indicate maybe I can retry and it will succeed. Right. Um, and that's what I'm doing. Sleep a little and try again later. Uh, and then if I try again, it should work. And so all of that to say, that's how we implement the item buttons key. Uh, because now since it's the same ID, the next time around? Because say say this, uh, I got an error, but actually the request went all the way through to Stripe, and they did make the charge, but for some reason it failed at the last second, or whatever, the last bit of it failed. So the charge actually went through, but they just failed to send me back that it went through. Um, if that happened, then this would prevent it from happening again. So that's a good thing. It's, it's the same as when you're like on, a, on your browser and you go to a store or something, you buy something, and then your network crashes, and you're like, did I actually buy it? You're not sure, right? And if you submit the form again, you might buy it twice. And that's what we're trying to do, is the buying it twice. Make sense? Yeah, casts are not typical, you don't see a lot of them, but they do happen sometimes with those. If you're sleeping for a whole second, does that slow your compute? Uh, your process that a lot? Uh, no, 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 sleep is very efficient. It puts it, uh, the Go routine to sleep, and so it's not actually doing anything. Oh, it's a Go routine going to sleep? Uh, so the scheduler knows to bring it back to life later. Uh, so it's efficient. It's not like uh, it's not like a wall true. It's not pegging the CPU while it's doing this. It's, it's sleeping. It's not blowing up other customers. No, it will take a little longer for the uh, eventual post to go through, but, but it's not physically doing work while it's waiting. Set back end? Yeah. How, how does that work? It's a bit more complicated. I'll throw it into the scratch. Okay. I'm curious. It's not actually in the ADI reference here. But it is in the GoDoc, isn't it? So it is in the GoDoc. I saw set back end. That's complicated. But that's probably the only way to do it properly, right? Yeah. I'm surprised I don't have an easier way of doing this. Uh, oh, what? Tanya, yeah, I love that you just made Caleb go, oh. I know, this, I did the same thing. <laughs> that was sweet. <laughs> it was sweet. <laughs> OK, so that's the same. Now we create a backend, and then we use the backend as part of the charge. We can't just set it here. No. So you have to say charge colon equal. Oh, it's not. It's a client. 
charge client. The key is the secret key. Oh, that you're that dark room. That's um, stripe.key, right? The back end is B. And then you use charge client and dot new. That's not terrible. No, this is why is it called B? I don't know. I think it's called back end. Uh, why do they call context C in the code act? Uh, because it's short. I mean, this this is like part of your public API. You probably want that to be longer. Uh, but calling it B here, it's just a local variable. So, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, so we create a backend configuration and then use it as part of this. That's not quite as clean as the other one. But it's it's only three more lines of code, so maybe that's not. Questions about that? Um, That'll be better if you have more of a person than mine at the same time from our $200,000 uh, <laughs> chart. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, so we did ID potency key. Uh, that's kind of advanced. You know, if you didn't have it, you probably would never have the problem. And like I said, you have the two guys who can fix all your problems, so just leverage them uh, when it breaks. Um, there's other things we can do. Part of that is a customer. So let me just talk about that real quick. You can, I think that's described in these docs a little better. When you create uh, this form and stuff, you, you can, instead of charging, uh, let's see, charge your customer, sign them up for a subscription, okay? Uh, you can do this create a plan thing. And then you can also do that through the through the page on the dashboard, and then you can subscribe them to it. So instead of uh, instead of doing the charge, what you do is you create a customer object, so you give them a name and stuff, um, and then you can add, sign them up for the plan, and that will put them in the plan. And then there's a monthly charge. Um, so, if, so if you're on, um, you know, you're signing up for Spotify or whatever, you, you'd probably sign up for a plan instead of a charge. But like I said, all that's described in their docs. And so if you were really wanting to do this, you could just read through all their docs and it would describe to you how to do it. And it would look very similar. It would be a slightly different method to call in the go code, but otherwise it would be pretty much identical. Um, so yeah, and there's lots more here. Uh, like I said, it gets complicated because nothing's ever easy. Um, and uh, but yeah. So this, uh, uh, does anybody know what a webhook is? Uh, sort of the reverse, the reverse of an API call for yeah. a API provider calling back into your information. Yeah, so the idea of a webhook is, uh, so we have an API, right? And we, we have our products, uh, you know, made off whatever. That's our product over here. And we're calling Stripe's API over here with get and post. What I wrote here, but that's fine. Uh, pose, this is Stripe. Um, uh, but really, communication is always uh, initiated by us. We're always making the request to the API, and the API is just responding, right? Um, but the, a the API can't initiate the call to us normally, right? Like Stripe can't just say, hey, app, uh, something happened, right? Not normally, not with an API the way this is written. We, if, if we wanted to do that, how could we do that? Webhook. A webhook. But another way we could do it is pull, right? And we've seen that already. So I could, if I wanted to get the status of a payment or something, I could query the API and get it. And periodically do that. Maybe every hour I ask. Um, but a webhook is a way to invert the flow to go the other direction. So with the webhook, the idea is you have your API. Um, and the first thing you do is you register a, an endpoint. So you say, uh, you know, send uh, send requests to, and you say localhost. This would not work in real life um, because you can't access localhost. Localhost uh, slash endpoint, right? Um, and now what will happen is when something happens, the API can initiate the request. Okay, um, by posting to the endpoint you told it to. 
And so now communication is inverted. So it's almost like you have an API and you're asking Stripe to use it for you. Okay. Uh, and so for Stripe, the kind of things we can use for web hosts is you can get notified when that chargeback happens. And so rather than having some person go to the dashboard and periodically look for the chargebacks and fix them, you can make a service on your site, receives the chargebacks from Stripe and does something, okay? Sends an email, whatever you want to do when that happens. And you can... A webhook is essentially your API provider telling you how to set up an API for them to call you back. Yeah. Um, so webhooks are a neat feature. They, we use them for other things too. Um, but am I understanding the idea? You know the tool for Sprint.go, I don't remember what it's called, for, for setting up a quick local host webhook server? No. I'll see if I can find it. You can't, you can't really use local host stuff because it's not accessible to the outside world. Yeah, yeah, that's what it does. He's, he's got a proxy, an HTTPS proxy, and he can force Oh, yeah, yeah, we saw that in Brock. Yeah, in Brock, exactly. We saw that. Um, but, yeah, webhooks just allow uh, Stripe to initiate communication to us. Um, I don't know if you'd actually need to do that, but you could. But this is a, a common idea that you see in other APIs as well. You, you have to do it, so if you're ringing a bell every time you get your $200,000. Yeah. Report? No, like I said, that's why you hire the intern to look at the dashboard. To ring the bell. <laughs> uh, okay, so any questions about Stripe? Before you go to your kind of setting and tell us that you can do a successful payment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's how we would do payments. Uh, hopefully that's not too painful. Um, it's kind of funny that this part is probably easier than most of the others, right? Uh, but, so we can get money. And that's, that's how you do payments, okay? So we will move on to the next topic, but we'll take a break first, okay?